This video was brought to you by us, Slidebean. Make beautiful slide presentations in no time. Get one free month by signing up at slidebean.com slash YouTube. It was the embodiment of the American dream, a migrant couple who starts from scratch and rises to the top of the clothing retail industry. But then that dream plummets to the ground. Forever 21 became a fixture in fashion and the wallets of 20-something year olds. The clothes were fashionable and cheap, and there was a Forever 21 store in almost every shopping mall you could think of. They were all over the world, and with the latest fashion trends on hand, they seemed to be here to stay. But Forever 21 was a controversial brand, to say the least. It grew too fast and had dubious practices. So it's safe to say that it rocked the world of fashion, for better or worse, and in 2019, it was the ever-changing world of retail that rocked Forever 21, so much that the company filed for bankruptcy protection. How did one of the world's most noticeable fashion brands manage to get to this point? So in this episode of Startup Forensics, we'll dive into how Forever 21 began, the wrong growth and expansion, of course, the controversy, the demise, and a glimpse into what the future of Forever 21 could look like. This is Startup Forensics Forever 21. How Forever 21 began. Korean immigrants Do Won Chan and Jin Suk Chan arrived in the US in the 80s and they had a rough time. They worked odd jobs, had very little money and no formal education to rely on. Do Won originally had hoped that, having worked at a coffee shop in Korea, his expertise in the area would be a gateway to his success, but it wasn't. He was stuck as a waiter, but he did notice something. The people who drove the nicest cars were all in the garment business. His instinct told him that the way to success was through fashion. So in 1984, they scraped up all the money they had, $11,000 in total, and opened a small clothing store called Fashion 21. The 900 square foot store was directed towards the Korean American community, women specifically. And it worked. The first year they made around $700,000 in revenue. With such results, they felt confident enough to expand at a brutally fast pace, a new store every six months. Don't forget this. By 1987, the Changs wanted to give Fashion 21 a twist. Their aim was to evoke an eternal desire for youth, a wish to remain in what Do Wan himself recalled the most enviable age, Forever 21. With a new catchy name and a profound understanding of their key demographic, Forever 21 did something that seemed a bit odd. Instead of importing garments at a lower operation cost, they chose to produce their clothes domestically. Why? Because this way, they had the latest fashion on hand quickly, faster than any other competitor. They would base themselves off ideas seen in Korea and produce them practically on site. Many of their items were very cheap, meant to be bought, worn, and sometimes discarded rather quickly. This is called fast fashion, and we'll talk about it later. For now, let's just say that they were well on their way to becoming an empire. The wrong growth and expansion. By 1989, I was born, but that's unrelated. Forever 21 had 11 stores all over California. They averaged around 5,000 square feet in size and the chain had even opened their first mall-based store. And by 1999, Forever 21 had 100 stores all over the US, some with 900 square feet or more in space. To diversify and capture even more buyers, they introduced Forever 21 in 2001, a new high fashion concept. Flagship stores opened in major cities like LA, Miami, and Chicago and were massive, averaging 24,000 square feet in size. Also remember this. All of this was fueled by Mrs. Chang's eye for business. Mrs. Chang and her nearly clairvoyant ability to predict trends were part of the catalyst that boosted Forever 21's upswing. That's a quote from Business Insider. And as I mentioned before, their key strategy was fast fashion. Given that the garment's intended use wasn't for the long run, most of Forever 21's clothing was cheaper and didn't have the highest quality. Now, take into consideration that fast fashion can and has been profitable for brands, but hedging all your bets on it can backfire. Fast fashion requires you to have cheap products that attract the customers to the company's other more expensive products. So the laws making cheap clothes work as a gateway, as a hook. To be successful with fast fashion, companies need to control variables like growth, supplies, and production cost. Now, with regards to that last item, how do you make cheap clothes? Yeah, the answer is sweatshops. But again, we'll talk about this in a minute. So the Changs 
knew they had to cater to bigger audiences. So in 2006, they introduced the men's line, a lingerie line in 2007, and a plus-size brand in 2009, as well as makeup and cosmetics. In 2010, they opened a 90,000 square foot store in Times Square with a visitor frequency of 100,000 people per day. So it came as no surprise that by 2015, Forever 21 brought in $4.4 billion in sales and Do Wan and Jin Suk had a net worth of over $5.9 billion. By 2018, there were 800 stores all over the world and the chain hired a total of almost 43,000 people. All of this while they kept the core business in the family as their two daughters, Linda and Esther, stepped into the company and helped expand it. And yes, of course, the company was expanding at an extremely high rate. But Forever 21 didn't pay attention to one very particular detail, online business. Their e-commerce was merely 16% of their total sales, and this made them very vulnerable to online shopping competition, which was evidently the future. Then there was the company image, controversies. Production costs in the clothing industry have always been controversial. The cheap end price is only the tip of the iceberg. In 2001, amidst their early expansion, employees from a Los Angeles factory sued Forever 21, alleging conditions that more closely resembled a sweatshop than a factory. Amidst these allegations were altered time cards, long work hours, payment below the minimum wage, and in some cases, no pay at all. This case generated a three-year boycott against Forever 21, and though it was eventually settled in 2004, the chain's image certainly took a hit. Then in 2014, the U.S. Department of Labor's Occupational Safety and Health Administration, that's the OSHA, recommended Forever 21 be fined with $100,000 for serious safety hazards in the stores. Yes, of course, this was pocket change for them, but the buck didn't stop there because it wasn't only about employee conditions. Designers claimed Forever 21 was copying their work. That included heavyweights like Diane von Fürstenberg, Anna Sui, Gwen Stefani, and Travada. Even Ariana Grande sued them for copying the style found in her Seven Rings video. Companies like Autodesk and Adobe filed a joint lawsuit against the company for using illegal pirated copies of their software. Come on, you turn in billions, you can at least pay for one license. Now, remember all those stores? Well, in some malls, they had also inflated sales figures to lure in renters. They're facing a lawsuit for this, another lawsuit. Also, some of the jewelry products had toxic cadmium in them. And to top it all off, the company has been accused of pushing a religious agenda. That's right, even religion got into the mix. You see, the Changs are born-again Christians and have consistently placed religious phrases in their products, such as holy and thank God, Jesus loves you, and so on. Even the verse John 3.16 is printed in their clothing. Is that Stone Cold Steve Austin? Whatever their beliefs, it's evident that the company didn't have a clean slate. In fact, it's a very messy one. But did all of this help in the company's demise? The demise. Controversies might not have been the ultimate cause for the brand's demise, but they did help in denting an operation that was already getting out of hand. Forever 21 had expanded too quickly, and Mrs. Chang admits to it. We went from seven countries to 47 countries within less than a six-year time frame. Seven to 47 in less than six years is a lot for a retail store. Remember what we said about the complexity of fast fashion? Well, again, Here's what she had to say. When we grew so quickly, there was a lot of complexity that we did not foresee. We weren't set up with the supply chains to support that kind of globalization. Having to tailor our assortment for different countries created a lot of nuances that added up to a big puzzle problem for us. So in summary, Forever 21 had too much success? Well, yes, they expanded too quickly and didn't have a good grasp on the entire process. That's never a good combination. Adding to this, Consumer behavior was changing. People don't go to shopping malls as much as they used to. Let's see some numbers now. In 2018, the company had sales that averaged $3.3 billion. That's a good big number. Not so much when you compare it to 2016, when they had sold $4.4 billion. That's a decrease of $1 billion in just two years. And the chain had a lot of stores that were big, shiny, but too expensive to operate, around 800 of them. So debt was piling up. So Though they tried to avoid bankruptcy by downsizing, it was eventually inevitable. So in 2019, the company filed for bankruptcy protection. This is when an individual or company has too much debt and can't pay it, so they ask to reorganize the entire debt operation. But it doesn't mean the company is dead. It means there's another chance to hopefully become profitable again. And though this announcement shocked the world at first, 
Some weren't surprised. Here's what Mark Cohen, a business professor, had to say. It's a self-inflicted catastrophe. This is a bonanza for the competition, and it's another death knell for the malls. They've already lost the Sears, Macy's, Pennies, and are struggling with footsteps diminishing every day. But such a big company wasn't just gonna disappear. A look into the future. The company was given a chance when they applied for protection, and they have acted in their efforts to rescue the company, the Changs, closed a lot of stores, a lot of stores, 350 stores. They also ceased operations in 40 countries to focus on the most profitable locations and injected some effort into their e-commerce platforms. Remember how their e-commerce was forgotten? Well, they took notice and worked on it. Will it be enough? We don't know, we'll find out. But the company has grown from 16% in 2016 to 25% in 2019. Keep in mind that their sales and entire operation is much smaller now. They have also ramped up their marketing and created alliances with Amazon and other online retailers, but somehow it feels as though there's something missing. They aren't too specific on what they're going to do. Perhaps they don't even know. But one thing is for sure, what made them great is extinct. The days of massive stores are gone. There's no longer a need for them. So this might not only be the tale of Forever 21, but rather the tale of many other department stores. Where are we headed to? What will happen with all these spaces? Will the future have clothing stores at all? Maybe as museums or exotic destinations to travel to. But for now, all we know is that Forever 21 can't stay alive only if they break away from the past. <laughs>